Welcome back to the Oscar Project Podcast, the show where I discuss Oscar-nominated films year by year. I am your host, Jonathan Eterberg, and today I'm bringing you an interview with Katie G. Salisbury, author of the forthcoming book, Not Your China Doll, The Wild and Shimmering Life of Anna Mae Wong. Before I jump into the interview, please subscribe to the show in your podcast player so you can get all the newest episodes as soon as they're released. If you like the interview and want to hear more, please consider leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Katie G. Salisbury is a writer and photographer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, The Believer, and the Asian American Writers Workshop. She also writes the newsletter Half Cast Woman, has spoken about her work at the Museum of Chinese in America, Barnard College, and New York University, and gave a TED Talk entitled As American as Chop Suey. She joins me on the show to talk about her first book, Not Your China Doll, The Wild and Shimmering Life of Anna Mae Wong. Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me today. Now, you talk in your preface to the book about how you came to know about Anna Mae Wong when you were a young intern at the Chinese American Museum, and it was more than a decade before this book became a reality. What made you return to Anna Mae and decide to make her the subject of your first book? Great question. Um, You know, I would actually say that I think anime never left me (laughs) as soon as I locked eyes on her. um, I was, you know, instantly fascinated and obsessed and, you know, I had never heard of her and Mm -hmm. having grown up in an Asian American community and also being um, half Chinese myself, I was just surprised that no one had ever even mentioned her name. I, she was a movie star and that seemed like such an incredible thing to have happen for a Chinese American in the 1920s and 30s. So, um, you know, I was just a college freshman at the time. And so, you know, I, it was the early days of, you know, Google search and YouTube and things like that. Um, so I was really just kind of trolling on the internet. And then yeah. um, by the time I was writing my senior thesis, I started researching her then, um, but realized that she wasn't going to fit into my argument. Um, and so anyways, I, I held on to the things that I had learned about her in college and, you know, then embarked on a career in book publishing in New York and was working on other people's books. And through that whole process, she was always in the back of my mind. And I was always thinking about, well, maybe one day I could write a book about her. And, right. you know, obviously it takes a little while to figure out how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so in my case, you know, by the time the book comes out, it will actually have been like 20 years oh since I first learned about her. Um, but I feel like that's a good, uh, I mean, it's kind of a good maturation of, of this interest and, and, and passion for her. Excellent. Now, you chronicle the travels of anime throughout her life. She left Hollywood to make movies in Europe before eventually returning to Hollywood. She even tried her hand at performing on stage and in some traveling shows. What was it about each of these areas that she enjoyed? And also, why did, why do you think Hollywood didn't truly appreciate the talent that she was until she'd gone to Europe and then came back? Mm. So, anime Wong was kind of endlessly resourceful and always reinventing herself, um, really out of practicality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she started her career in silent films and, you know, transitioned to talkies, did radio shows, um, had her own television show in the 1950s, did theater. Um, so she kind of did every medium by the time that she died in 1961. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that she just, you know, roles were not handed out to her. Right. She had to make her own luck and, And it's really a testament to her ability not to give up that she consistently, you know, well, when she wasn't getting cast in films in the 1930s in Hollywood, she said, well, fine, you know, I've done some personal appearance tours. Maybe I can develop those into some my own cabaret show. So that's what she did. She took her cabaret show to Europe, where it was a sensation. She traveled all over the continent. Um, Similar thing, you know, in the night in the late 1920s, when she wasn't getting she wouldn't be cast in lead roles in Hollywood because of her race, um, because she was Asian and they couldn't have a leading lady in a romantic role with a white actor um, because that was um, seen as, you know, verboten, even though that's pre-code um, Hollywood directors and studios would just use that as an excuse for right. why they couldn't cast her in those roles. So, you know, being fed up with that, you know, some people would have just quit done something else, but she really loved being an actor. So she thought, well, there were opportunities for her in, in Europe and she was offered a role in a film that was written specifically for her in Berlin. So she thought, well, why not go? And she was 23, had never 
you know, other than having gone to Canada, she'd never been outside <laughs> of the country. So it's a pretty big leap for her. Yeah. Um, but, but I think really, I mean, the, the reason that she had to leave Hollywood to get recognition is really, um, unfortunately, the race issue. Um, I mean, she was the for a long time, I mean, beginning of her career, the only woman of color of note who was even, you know, in mainstream films in Hollywood. Right. And so her career was dismissed to a certain extent because people didn't see her in the same light. They didn't see her as having these opportunities to become a star because she wasn't white. And so um, she really had to prove herself. And, you know, by becoming a star in Europe, Hollywood could no longer ignore her that she was successful and that people actually wanted to see her on screen. Absolutely. Now you also write about anime's first time visiting China in the late 1930s. You mentioned how the Chinese saw her as being too American yet here in the U S she was too Chinese. Like you were just saying, how did mm -hmm. that perception on both sides of the globe affect her career in the movies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a, unfortunately still a very common phenomenon for a lot of multicultural Americans that um, in America, they're not American enough. And right. then in their home country or home culture, they're not enough of that. And that is certainly something she experienced as someone who, you know, at that time, 100 years ago, it was relatively rare to find someone as Chinese American as she was. I mean, it wasn't really a term at that time. Um, so I think that, you know, in her early career, because the perception of her was, oh, she must be Oriental. She must only speak Chinese. She must be this lovely, you know, China doll, because that was always the perception. I think she worked really hard to subvert that. I mean, she was American by birth right. and she had grown up in Los Angeles and she was a very fashionable and trendy young woman. So she knew all the, you know, the 1920s the flapper slang. Um, so in a way, she kind of heightened that part of her personality to really surprise people. You know, she would be saying things like, oh, you know, you, you know, I just bought this new coat, but, you know, I, I don't know what you think about it. Like sometimes you buy something on sale and it's like what the cat dragged in. You know, she would say <laughs> these kind of very quirky things and people would just be like, wow, well, she's not at all what I thought of a Chinese woman. And so she, so she definitely in her personal life and with press and reporters in Hollywood, she played up her Americanness. That didn't necessarily transfer into the film she was cast in because she was really put into these exotic roles um, where people, you know, playing very typical um, exoticized, you know, Chinese women, um, foreigners. Um, so that didn't necessarily carry over into her films. And I think when she went to China, and she finally heard firsthand from so many Chinese, like, why do you portray us this way? Because a lot of people in China really felt like, well, you know, Anime Wong is the only representation of us in America. And now Americans think that we are all like that and right. we're not. And which is, you know, obviously not a fair one person can't represent an entire country <laughs> or culture. So it's a, a little bit of an unfair expectation. But, you know, to her credit, she was very open to the criticism that she heard over and over again in China. And, and that trip really changed her so that when she came back to the U.S., she had a different understanding of her role and responsibility as an actress. And so she came back and said, look, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to take on any other roles that make the Chinese look bad anymore. I'm just not going to do it. And she ended up um, doing a series of films at Paramount that were actually really incredible for their time. I mean, she was playing a leading lady um, with also another Asian American leading male um, played by Philip on and solving mysteries, busting crimes. So she really found a way to um, turn around that stereotype that she had started her career with um, and make it into something very positive and, and frankly, quite radical for the times. Yeah, for sure. And, and you, you were saying earlier how people weren't quite sure, you know, they expected her to speak Chinese. And, you know, you mentioned she started in the silent film, so they, they mm -hmm. didn't get to hear her speak until she'd already been established in her career. So that was probably also yes. surprising when they actually got to hear her. Definitely. Um, now, much of the middle part of the book uh, covers the making of the film version of The Good Earth, which anime was offered a supporting role in, and she declined in order to take that trip to, to China. We talked about how might her career have been different if the people behind that film had been willing to give her that leading role of Olan in the film, uh, The Good Earth. 
So I talk a lot about the good earth and part of the reason why, I mean, aside from my own personal obsession with it, (laughs) (laughs) um, is that it's a film that consistently gets brought up when we talk about anime Wong, because it's like, well, it was an Oscar nominated award-winning film and she could have had the lead role. Um, That's as the story goes. And, um, you know, she very deftly, you know, declined the kind of smaller role that they offered her and decided instead to go to China and kind of build her own publicity, you know, story narrative around this trip to China to really show Americans like, well, this is what China's truly like if you if you want to know rather mm-hmm. than this Hollywood version. And so I felt I, I felt that it was really fascinating to look at what her travels in China were like in these very cosmopolitan cities like um, Shanghai um, versus this very um, contrived, supposedly authentic version of China that was, you know, painstakingly recreated in Southern California with all of these Chinese American actors who themselves had never been to China and were wondering, well, is this <laughs> is this what it's like to right. to be really Chinese? And so, so there's a lot of interesting kind of contradictions and uh there by by being able to see both of those things happening at the same time um you know would her career have been different if she had been cast as olan um i mean it's nice to think that it would have been but a, a lot of me thinks that it wouldn't have been like if they had given it to her it would have been you know seen as just you know, maybe even like, oh, you know, you're the token, you know, this is a affirmative action type right. thing. We're going to just give you this role. And people might have said, oh, well, she wasn't that good, even though she is Chinese or, you know, or it was easy for her because it she's had Chinese. Different expectations. So she knows... Exactly. And so I don't think that um, the expectation, I don't, I don't think she would have been praised necessarily if she had had the role. And I think really, I mean, I think I guess the, the real point is that they could have cast her if they had wanted to. They really could have. I don't think I think people always wanted to see her on screen. But the real thing that had to change beyond just this film was the entire attitude towards her that like she just wasn't, you know, they just never saw her as a leading lady. Yep. Uh, and now family seemed to be one of the uh, important parts of anime's life as well. Obviously, she grew up in her father's laundry in Los Angeles. Uh, she lived with her, her brother at her estate that she bought later in life, sisters at various times in her life. How does that family connection uh, inform her work throughout her career? So throughout anime's career, um, she really leaned upon her family, but also was always looking for ways to bring them into the Hollywood business. Um, so I would say a, most of a lot of her siblings and, and her family at one time or another were either extras. Um, her younger sister, Mary, was her stand in for many years when she worked at Paramount. Um, Lulu, her older sister, was kind of like her manager who traveled with her to Europe and managed her affairs and, and sometimes her, you know, accounts. Um, and so she, I, you know, there's a, there, she had a true joy for being around her family. And I think part of that just maybe happens, it comes from growing up in a very close knit family, a large family, right. living in close quarters who has to work together when they're younger, you know, helping out at the laundry, helping out with their parents. Um, so there was always, I think, you know, she was just used to be being surrounded by them. And even in her early career, she had a hard time. She kind of moved in and out of the laundry, couldn't decide whether she should have an apartment in her Hollywood or, you know, be at home. And, um, you know, eventually she came back because her dad built her this bungalow in the back of the the of the yard to the the laundry so she could have her own space but still be close to family um so i think it was immensely important to her and you know later in life because she decided that she would never marry um you know that those that was the only family that she had and so of course she held them very dear to her um so i think in in her later films you really do see some of the reverence and closeness she had um you know, in a film like um, King of Chinatown, for example, which I think came out in 1939, she had a lot more influence over the film. And um, she's playing a Chinese American surgeon. And um, her father, the, the her father in the film is those two characters are very close, like she visits her father at his herb shop in Chinatown. She brings home her colleagues from the hospital to celebrate Ch- Chinese New Year with her family. So 
later on, she really was able to kind of bring some of her own Chinese American experiences to the screen and share those with others. Definitely. Now, toward the end of the book, you mention a number of Asian and Asian American actors working in films today. And how, how did Anna May help pave the way for folks like Michelle Yeoh and Kiwi Kwan, who are obviously recognized at the Oscars last year? And we've touched on it a little bit, but how might that have been different if she had been recognized by the Academy in her own time? It's a great question. Um, uh, you know, Anna May Wong, whether or not people were familiar with her career, she certainly pa did pave the way for them. I mean, having, I mean, there's so many firsts in her career, right? I mean, first Asian American movie star, um, you know, first, you know, first Asian American to play a leading role in a, you know, in a film um, to, you know, first to have her own television show, um, you know, first to play a romantic lead with another Asian American actor. So, in the sound era. So, so many firsts. Um, and I think that a lot of Asian actors, you know, following her time have been very much inspired by what she accomplished during her career. And so in many ways, mm -hmm. you know, it helps show people that those things are possible. Um, certainly it wasn't easy. And I think there is this larger narrative that um, people in Hollywood sometimes like to tell that oh, well, you know, there aren't that many Asians here because there just never were. And I think looking at her story really debunks that um, and shows right. that, well, yeah, they were actually here. They've been, they've been here since the very they've beginning. Been here from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, you can't, so you can't say that. And I think that is one of the things that allows people to keep going because they know that someone else has done it before them and they can also use her as a, you know, look, like she was there and, and there's no reason why we, we're, we shouldn't be allowed into Hollywood too. Um, you know, I think it would have been different had the Academy, um, or had the Academy recognized her, had a studio or director really nurtured her career and taken her under her, their wing, um, mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have had this very long gap in, you know, just a real dearth of any Asian American projects in, until Crazy Rich Asians, uh, you know, a couple, you know, several years ago. So I, I think it would have been different. There wouldn't have been this collective forgetting if she had been acknowledged by some of the institutions in Hollywood. But I think we're, you know, I'm ecstatic to see like how much has changed just in the last five years. Um, sure. And, and also, and as we've seen things start to change and, and so many more projects come into Hollywood, um, we're also seeing a lot more people recognizing her, her legacy. And so it's, I think it's really interesting too, to see how those two things go together. And when we forget about her, we also forget the fact that, well, you know, we deserve to be there too. Sure. Now you had a, a long list of references <laughs> at the end of the book, but were there any specific books or articles or films, anything that people should check out if they enjoyed yours and want to learn even more about anime Wong? Yeah. I mean, well, so there's some specific aspects that I would definitely recommend people look into. Um, like if these are a little bit tangential, but some of the books that I've really enjoyed reading while I was working on the book, um, uh, one was um, Ghosts of Gold Mountain by Gordon Chang, um, which is a history of um, Chinese working on the railroad, building the railroad on the West Coast. And so it's really a history of the Chinese in America and their contributions to building the West. And so even though that's a, a bit of a tangential part of her story, I think it was important for me to understand that, you know, legacy because her dad, you know, had been, her dad was born in a Northern California mining town during that time when, right. when it was still really the Wild West. Um, so that was really interesting for me. Another book I really enjoyed was um, River of Shadows by Rebecca Solnit, which is just a fantastic, I mean, it's so beautifully written, but it's a fantastic book about um, Edward Moybridge, who is credited as inventing motion pictures and um, through his motion um, photographic studies. And so it's just a really fascinating story. But if you're interested in like where film came from, um, I definitely recommend that. And then, um, you know, I just got so enthralled with Hollywood history in general <laughs> when I was researching this. So, I mean, I read countless um, Hollywood biographies and memoirs 
Um, but one that I would really love to go back to because I didn't get to read all of it was Gloria Swanson's um, Swanson on Swanson, which was just like so deliciously written, so gossipy. Um, so <laughs> I definitely really love that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is, you know, when it comes to anime Wong, there is actually now like a huge canon of literature built up around her. Um, so, I mean, where to even begin? I mean, you know, um, Russell Gow Hodges kind of wrote the original book, which is, you know, very exhaustive in terms of her biography. Um, there's also Anthony B. Chan has a number of wonderful essays in his book. And Shirley uh, J. Lim has written a book as well that's um, more recent and it looks more at her kind of cabaret performances and how she refashioned herself in different modes. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff out there for people to explore. Excellent. We'll be sure to put, include those in the show notes and, and put links in wherever possible. Now, I have a couple of questions not specifically related to the book, but before I move on, is there anything else you want to touch on about the book or Anime Wong? No, I mean, I think all of your questions have been really thought-provoking for me. Great. Well, this might be the hardest question then. You've obviously watched a lot of films um, over the course of your career and probably in your research for this book. But if you could only pick your top three, what would they be? <laughs> this is like the this is always the hardest question, right? To say yes, what's yeah. <laughs> your favorite film because whatever you say, you know, you're leaving out so many that you just can't sure. think of at the time. Um, so I tried to think about this for a few minutes um, earlier today. Uh, I mean, I hands down my favorite film, number one favorite film, is Empire Strikes Back. Um, I'm just a closet Star Wars fan <laughs> and <I> probably <laughs> seeing that film more than any other film in my life. Um, so I just, that's my favorite film for sure. Um, what else? Uh, I also, I think I just love the film Swingers um, because it's such, I'm from Los Angeles originally, even though I live mm -hmm. in Brooklyn now. And it's just such a great LA movie and also captures that 90s spirit. I mean, I was only a kid then, but there's just something really like fun and nostalgic. And, and that film just never gets old for me. I just, it's like every time it comes up in conversation, I end up watching it that same night. Um, sure. So I love that <laughs> film. And then I'm going to say, I mean, this is probably just now this is like a film nerd thing to say, but like I also just really love Vertigo, um, which, uh, you know, Hitch, you can't go wrong with Hitchcock. Um, Having gone to school in Northern California, I thought always just love the way that Vertigo portrayed San Francisco itself. And I just, that film is so haunting because, I mean, so much about it is haunting, but then somehow every time I start to watch it again, I forget what's going to happen. So I, right. I feel like it's very rare that you can watch a film that many times and still um, kind of be- Still get pulled in. Exactly. And be on the edge of your seat. Excellent. Now, a uh, little bit more fun question. If you could invite any three movie characters to your next dinner party, who would they be and why? <laughs> um, this is really, this is also a very difficult question um, because, so I think so often we conflate actors with their characters. So I don't yeah. know if I could fudge it a little bit and say an actor instead of a character or... <laughs> Sure. Yeah, why not? Um, <laughs> we'll allow it. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I, I would I would die to meet Anime Wong. So in person, so <laughs> any character she played, I would be happy to meet <laughs> have it at a dinner party. Um, then I would also say Indiana Jones. Um, okay. Just always had a crush on him since I was a little girl. <laughs> um, and who would be the third? Let's see. Um, very, very, very tough. Um kind of drawing on a blank but um i don't know maybe how about the little mermaid <laughs> i'll go with another nostalgic pick okay well that that's a that's a very interesting dinner party i i think that'd be a good one um now do you have any you mentioned a bunch of books that you did in your uh, read in your research but do you have any other books that you can recommend that you've read recently uh don't necessarily have to be about movies could be fiction nonfiction, anything that you've been reading recently Yeah. Um, well, it just so happens that I did just read a Hollywood related book. Um, I just read um, Lulu in Hollywood, which is basically a collection of Louise Brooks's um, essays that she wrote later in life about her time in Hollywood, which is also very gossipy and, and fascinating. I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, and then I recently just read um, a Clint Smith's okay. book, um, How the Word is Passed which is 
all about um, these different kind of landmark places across the American South and their relationship to um, American history, to slavery, how, and also about like how history is remembered and taught today in the U.S. And so that was a really um, thought-provoking uh, read. I mean, it really challenges you to kind of think about your own understanding of American history. And it was really interesting to learn about a lot of these places that I'd never been to. Um, and then right now I'm also reading, I'm just in the middle of it, I'm reading a book um, by Ed Park called Same Bed, Different Dreams. Um, or is it, wait, no, <laughs> Same Dream, Same Dream, Different Beds. I'm, I'm getting it, <laughs> I'm getting it mixed up. Um, but it's like a really fascinating, it's a really fun, I mean, it's a novel, and but you actually get to learn a lot mm. about Korean history um, and about, uh, you know, the the country splitting. And so it's, it has a little bit of like um, speculative aspects to it, um, but it's also about writers and I don't know, it's just, it's, it's kind of jam packed with a lot of different things. So I'm enjoying that right now as well. Very interesting. Um, and lastly, before we wrap up, I know uh, you just finished this book not too long ago and you're, you're working on promotion for it. But uh, do you have any other projects lined up next? And where can folks follow you on social media to keep updated with those? So I'm still in the uh, brainstorming uh, uh, space for any next book projects. Um, but I would love for people to follow me at Half Cast Woman, which is a newsletter that I write. Um, it's, you know, mostly about Animate Wong, but we also talk about other people, other Asian Americans in Hollywood, um, representation in general, and I'll also be updating people about the book there. Um, or you can find me um, at um, Instagram. I have a book dedicated Instagram channel that's called just at Anime Wong Book. Um, so there's tons of photos of anime and um, also news and updates about the book. Um, yeah, so I'd love for people to follow me in those two places. Thank, thank you. Excellent. Well, we'll, uh, we'll link to those in the notes as well. And uh, Katie, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciated you taking the time to speak with me and for sharing the stories and information about the book and uh, about Anime Wong. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And I, I your questions really um, made me think about a lot of things that I hadn't, hadn't actually, you know, since having written the book, I hadn't had the chance to really think about. So I appreciate that. Excellent. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you again to my guest today, Katie G. Salisbury. Her upcoming book, Not Your China Doll, is out March 12th, and I'll have a link to where you can pre-order it from the show notes, along with links to the movies and books mentioned throughout the interview. The Oscar Project Podcast is written and produced by me, Jonathan Etroberg, with editing assistance from Joshua Etroberg. Please come back for my next episode to hear from another author writing about the film industry. Until then, I hope to see you at the movies.